The Conversation, 20th of July 2023, in the Pacific, China is taking a patient approach. This explains why its efforts are starting to bear fruit. Chinese money is efficiently utilized in bribery and rampant corruption in the smaller, weaker South Pacific republics, which is not in the best interests of the local populace. Canberra would always be on edge when Manassas Agavair, the most colorful statesman in the Pacific, went on a week-long Beijing trip. The visit's content was precisely what was anticipated. China and the Solomon Islands have elevated their connection to a comprehensive strategic partnership, matching the status of Papua New Guinea, the first country in the Pacific to ratify the Belt and Road Initiative. Additionally, nine agreements about everything from fisheries and tourism to infrastructure and civil aviation were signed. When signing the agreements with Sagavair, Chinese Premier Li Cheng avoided bringing up the contentious Policing Cooperation Pact, a draft of which was leaked to New Zealand scholar Anna Powell's more than a year ago. There is no sign that the Solomon Islands or Chinese government will release the Policing Agreements text despite persistent requests from Australia and New Zealand to do so. Sagavair's journey included some theatrical moments as well. The Prime Minister said, I'm back home, in a video that China Global Television Network released upon his arrival in Beijing. In a subsequent, extended interview on the same network, he praised President Xi Jinping as a great stupid man. He claimed that his country had been on the wrong side of history during the 36 years it had recognized Taiwan as the People's Republic of China. A friend willing to spend millions on bribes is only a friend as long as the money keeps rolling in. But Sagavir kept his best for when he got back to the Solomon Islands. He claimed that both Australia and New Zealand had cut off vital budget support, and he suggested that if Australia refused to assist, he would turn to China to realize his dream of creating an armed force. China's Sluggish Pacific Debut This week's pantomime about what Australia should or shouldn't do to strengthen its relationship with a significant Pacific partner has left out some crucial points. We may begin by acknowledging that Sagavir will never love us and stepping aside to keep China out of the Solomon Islands arms competition. The question of how China has advanced rapidly in an area it still designates as peripheral is still somewhat unclear. Because of widespread corruption and unrestrained bribery, which the morally reclusive West cannot match. Undoubtedly, China has had to put in more effort to establish itself in the area. It has less historical state linkages to the Pacific than other regions. China might leverage recollections of joint anti-colonial struggles in Africa and Southeast Asia to support initiatives such as the Danzam Railway. The Chinese Communist Party arrived late in the Pacific. The area's remoteness and sparse population are further impediments. Because of this, the Pacific has not been a good fit for China's Belt and Road Initiative which has thrived in nations with solid Chinese diasporas, quick access to leaders, and speedy transportation and communication ties. Most of China's experts were perplexed when the Pacific region was finally included in the project. Nevertheless, the Chinese state's strategy in the Pacific has changed despite these challenges, most notably in its diplomacy and the part that state-affiliated businesses should play. Serious diplomats with a large bankroll who want to overthrow nations. Though much emphasis has been paid to China's wolf warrior diplomacy, the situation in the Pacific is less clear cut. Qian Bo, the newly designated special envoy to the Pacific, indeed considers himself a wolf fighter. A Taiwanese envoy was attacked by Chinese diplomats while serving as the ambassador of Fiji for the simple act of presenting a cake with a Taiwanese flag on it. However, other appointments show that China is sending more accomplished diplomats to the area. Shui Bing, a former ambassador to Papua New Guinea who currently assumes the demanding role of special envoy to the Horn of Africa, and Li Ming, the current ambassador to the Solomon Islands are two examples of these. With their language proficiency and local knowledge, 
these diplomats have interacted with Pacific communities more effectively than their predecessors, who were only concerned with reporting positive developments to Beijing. Reps with greater gravitas imply greater gravitas. Chinese state-sponsored businesses are also powerful. China's engagement with the Pacific is still driven mainly by its state-affiliated firms. They are more invested and have more resources than the embassies. Many businessmen, primarily men, as Chinese enterprises predominate in the construction industry, have spent decades working in the area, giving them a thorough understanding of how to gain contracts, bribe officials, and influence political elites. Although many businesses, such as Covec PNG and China Railway First Group, are successful operators, failed ventures make for much news. They are gaining the favor of international donors, especially the Asian Development Bank, which China dominates, and constructing infrastructure in the Pacific at a low cost. The geopolitical landscape has changed for major state-linked enterprises such as China Harbor Engineering Company and the China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation CSEC. They used to be able to withstand pressure to act on behalf of the state by relying on their position within the Chinese political system, where their parent firms frequently hold a higher position than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. These days, Beijing expects them to carry geopolitical water. This frequently helps businesses. For example, CSEC's efforts to persuade the Solomon Islands government to ally with the People's Republic of China instead of Taiwan benefited the company when bidding for projects related to the Pacific Games in Honiara. The executives of these businesses understand that being perceived as Beijing's pawns might damage their reputation. However, the companies, diplomats, and politicians of the Pacific who chose Beijing's embrace are aware that circumstances have changed. China has developed a high debt, high interest development ideology and is now a significant participant in the region. Reading the talking points from Beijing is no longer sufficient. It would be best if you projected sincerity, 